Hello Internet, I'm Jackie Fox. It's 2021 and we are finally seeing that light at the end of the tunnel that Trump said he could see about a year ago. Maybe he was feeling kind of lightheaded from COVID when he said that because he publicly caught the virus not too long after. But now millions of Americans don't have to worry so much about getting the virus like our former president did because thanks to massive government investment in untested vaccine technology, we actually have a choice of vaccines here in the United States. In many of the world's wider nations, the story is pretty much the same. In France, the government is worried that people are vaccine shopping for a preferred brand of vaccine, and in the process passing up what may be most available to them, creating unnecessary vaccine waste. Remember how you felt only six months ago? before the first news that mRNA vaccines might have a 90 plus percent success rate. I remember the realization that the traditional vaccine process takes years at best, and imagining what an America three years into a quarantine and economic collapse would look like. And that made me curl up on the floor in the fetal position levels of Big Sad. Remember for a second how desperate we were for any promise of safety from the virus. There was an outbreak of people drinking bleach and pool cleaner to try to get safe. Now, imagine passing up on a vaccine because it just wasn't the brand you were into only a few months later. There are places in the world that still feel that desperate, though because the main vaccine formulas are owned by companies primarily in the first world majority white countries, and that's where it's effectively distributed. Over 100 countries have yet to administer their very first dose. And when there isn't enough to go around because people didn't get the vaccines that have been made available to them, plus the limitations in production and transportation due to temperature requirements to prevent the mRNA vaccines from degrading, it's the poor, non-white countries that are missing out on shipments. It's easy to feel like this is all over if you live in America, Europe, Canada, or the UK. Okay, maybe not so much the UK, but we'll get to that later. But places like India, where the virus is infecting more people than ever, now let's get you an update with how the pandemic is panning out in India. The country has crossed the 400,000 mark as far as the number of infections is concerned. And yet again, India witnessed its highest single day surge of COVID-19 cases. On your screens now is the trajectory of COVID-19 outbreak in India. More than 15,000 cases, new cases were reported in just the last 24 hours. India hit a new grim milestone Saturday. Daily new COVID-19 cases topped 400,000 for the first time. The second wave is worsening rapidly. India has already recorded more than 300,000 daily cases for 10 straight days. Some experts blame mass religious gatherings and political rallies for the severity of the wave. More than 3,500 people have died in just the past 24 hours. Hospitals, morgues, and crematoriums are overwhelmed. In Africa, where several experimental trials of the vaccines took place, still isn't receiving much in the way of vaccine shipments. According to the World Trade Organization, low-income countries only administered 0.2%, that's 1.4 million of 700 million global doses. It's easy for us to sit back and think of those as far away places, but remember in 2019, this strain of the virus was contained in Wuhan, China, and that's pretty far away too. The danger is that as the virus rips through a few million people a week, like in India and Africa, it will be given ample opportunity to mutate into a form requiring completely new vaccines to immunize against. The sad news at the moment is that some parts of the country have now got traces of a triple mutation. And in order to beat it, we need as much information on this as possible. This explainer now has some of the details about India's triple mutation. Two out of these three mutations in this variant are known to confer immune escape, making this not work against either acquired antibodies or the vaccine antibodies, which is a reason to worry. We may need to re-engineer the vaccines in future to deal with these escape uh, variants. But that is what the whole world will have to do, not just India. Hmm. As the variants take over globally, we have to keep re-engineering the vaccine 
to make sure that it affords enough protection. Vaccines that we developed last year may no longer be adequate, just as monoclonal antibodies developed last year have been withdrawn, have, have FDA has disapproved them because they're no longer working against the variants. And this new COVID variant has already made its way out of third world countries and into places like the UK. How long will it take before variants like this reach the borders of the US? We don't work together to make sure that this is massively distributed around the world. We're going to continue to have this problem, not only with COVID, but as you pointed out, God forbid another pandemic or crisis comes down the line. COVID-21, let's call it. If there were a COVID-19 pandemic happening inside of a COVID-21 pandemic, you'd need at least two vaccines, one of which hasn't been developed yet, to be safe. Until we end the pandemic, this risk of mutation continues. COVID could well become the next annual virus, like the flu. We can't limit vaccinations to those countries that can afford them. In a pandemic, global health is inseparable from local health. Unlike other issues where we turn a blind eye to the suffering in poor nations, this one will sooner or later result in the next apocalypse-like pandemic. The next one will be worse, as most of the effective mutations for COVID appear to be those that increase in transmissibility. You think masks are annoying? Imagine grocery shopping in a hazmat suit. Because of exponential growth, increases in transmissibility are ironically far more deadly than increases in lethality. COVID-21 will really make COVID-19 look like a bad flu, like so many pundits said. Luckily, as far as we know, COVID-21 can't be proven to exist yet. But India and Africa have facilities that could be made to support the production of the vaccine. If they make it within their own country, the issues of transportation virtually disappear, and they're no longer waiting for the global North's leftovers. Why doesn't this happen? What would you do if there was a child right in front of you, sitting all alone, crying in pain, near death from sickness? And what if all you had to do was reach into your pocket and pull out the patent rights to the COVID-19 vaccine. To save that child's life. In general, it's a mess. And it's a mess for basically one simple reason, greed. Pharma wants to keep their profits high, and they have aggressively lobbied their home countries in the US and in the EU to make sure that they can achieve that goal. Protecting their patent monopolies so that generic versions of their life-saving vaccines cannot be manufactured, which would both increase supply and lower the cost. They have had an extraordinarily powerful ally in that fight to protect their bottom line, human lives be damned, our own supposed savior of global public health, Bill Gates. Let me cut right to the chase here. Liberals' favorite billionaire hero, Bill Gates, is lying to you in a way that is profoundly harmful for lives in the global south and for your health right here in the US. There's been some speculation that the changing intellectual property rules um, and, and allowing these vaccines, as you say, the, the the recipe for these vaccines to be shared would be helpful. And do you think that would be helpful? No. Why not? Well, there's only so many vaccine factories in the world. So let's just unpack what he says there. His argument is that lifting patent protections will not help the supply problem whatsoever. So it's better to just stay the course and produce at the current level and hope that eventually rich, rich countries donate enough money and surplus vaccines that poor countries get taken care of. In his words, it's not like there's some idle vaccine factory with regulatory approval that makes magically sa safe vaccines. Oh, really? I present to you this article from the AP in an industrial neighborhood on the outskirts of Bangladesh. Uh, lies a factory with gleaming new equipment imported from Germany. It's immaculate hallways lined with hermetically sealed rooms. It's operating at just a quarter of its capacity. It is one of three factories that the AP found on three continents whose owners say they could start producing hundreds of millions of COVID-19 vaccines on short notice if only they had the blueprints and the technical know-how. I present also to you John Fulton, president of BioLease in Canada, who says he could be making millions of doses today if the know-how had been shared. We've been passed over. We've got this production capacity and it's not being put to use. If we had started this last year, we could have shipped millions of doses by now. This is supposed to be like a wartime effort, everyone in it together, but that 
does not seem to be the case. And finally, I present to you the words of Manuel Martin, a policy advisor to Doctors Without Borders. The Gates organization dampened early enthusiasm by saying that IP is not an access barrier in vaccines. That's just demonstratively false. Bill Gates has an ideological commitment to massive, not only monopoly power, but patent IP protection, because that's how he made his money. Considering that they'd be some of the only companies in the world that would have the know-how to make a COVID-21 vaccine quickly, such an outbreak would actually be quite profitable for them. I'm not saying Bill Gates is rooting for COVID-21, but he's sure as hell not pulling for Africa or India. By stubbornly demanding he receive a monopoly on the formula for the vaccine that he invested money into producing, he's actually dooming the world like a super villain. This relates to the fact that Bill Gates is just a bad person to be steering global health policy. This is an unelected position that he holds as a major investor. Don't take it from me though, Thought Slime really nails why Bill Gates is, at best, a well-intentioned fool when it comes to the intricacies of how to effectively allocate resources for global health policy. Please do not mistake my criticism of Bill Gates for criticism of his very good toilet and the importance of sanitation. However, despite the good work that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has achieved, there are a few problems with their methods and the causes they choose to support. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's generous donations result in a frankly ridiculous access to the seats of power worldwide. They contribute 10% of the World Health Organization's yearly operating budget and thus possess a disproportionate authority over the WHO's priorities. Likewise, in 2013, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was the single largest donor to the UN Health Agency, donating more than the US government. And while it's good that they're funding these operations, it's bad that individual people have such influence over the objectives of these organizations. Sonia Shaw, an award-winning journalist, has pointed out similar problems with eradication campaigns against malaria. Efforts that, quite counterintuitively, have caused money to flood to where it is least needed. Shaw has pointed out a paradox of eradication versus control efforts. Eradicating a disease is, in several important respects, a goal diametrically opposed to controlling one. When public health leaders want to control a disease, they devote the majority of their resources to the areas of greatest needs, she writes. When their goal is eradication, then they must spend their resources on areas where eradication is most likely, the areas with the least need. Eradicating a disease means focusing on areas where the disease is close to being eradicated. That means pumping money for disease control into areas where, categorically, that disease is not doing very much damage. And while it would be good to eradicate polio in those areas, it shouldn't take priority over treating diseases that are less close to eradication and therefore are hurting more people. That might be a winning strategy in the board game pandemic. It's not so great in real life. He's sort of um, a third force hinge uh, figure between civil society, um, the industry, and to another extent, governments. And he has power in a very singular way uh, over all of these overlapping circles. And he has used that influence. Basically, uh, when you look at uh, the last 20 years, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that aside from the concrete contributions he's made in absolute terms, um, which are real enough. If you step back, he seems to have performed the role of running interference for what is uh, a system failure. We have a failed system on two very important fronts, which have been made clear in the current pandemic, access and research and development. And to the extent that he has obfuscated that system failure with uh, promises that the edges can be sanded down and tweaked with market incentives um, and market mechanisms, uh, it's gonna be much harder to get past that market, that system failure until we understand that role more clearly. But this isn't the only way that copyright ruins things for everyone, though it is arguably the most dramatic. Another video I'd recommend is from Comrade Pirate Unique Namasaurus's jam, you hate all these companies for the same reason. 
Three companies each have active patents that cover one or two of the four known types of modern insulin essential for type 1 diabetes, and it doesn't get any more impossible to replicate than literally illegal. And while original patents have expired, new patents that cover new formulations and advancements have had so little difference with the original that replicators of the original are still liable for patent infringement. Which you can tell because companies trying to make their own insulin like the Open Insulin Project and Lynette are specifically trying to make and approve a biosimilar, not a bioreplicate, a generic, which is easier to get approved. Until we make one, the big three price fix and there are big million view videos showing the patents, companies and price fixing they're involved in, but none mention price fixing cartels don't work unless you prevent replication. All you've done is create incentives for new companies and the cartel stops being profitable if you have to invite them all in. Since we see this apocalypse coming so clearly and we have time to act, we should, shouldn't we? In a movie, when a meteor is hurtling down towards Earth, we do everything we can to save the world. The United States government just asked us to save the world. Anybody want to say no? We don't look into the sky and say, we could destroy it, but that's just not profitable. Thankfully, the fix is pretty easy. The US government can temporarily revoke the patent. Big Pharma can have their vaccine monopoly after we save the world at the very least. Since the government actually invested more into the vaccine than Gates did, even by his own logic, the US citizens now represent a larger stakeholder in the vaccine than Bill's millions. Now for the bad news. While he hasn't addressed this particular issue directly, in a recent speech to a joint session of Congress, Biden vowed to defend American IPs across the world. He doubled down on intellectual property rules. Uh, he, he said that we will defend America's interest across the board. America will stand up to unfair trade practices and undercut American workers and American industries like subsidies from state to state owned operations and enterprises and the theft of American technology and intellectual property. Which is his basically saying uh, that, you know, this is his getting refusing to uh, get behind the free sharing of IP for vaccines. Which, by uh, the way, if I could just pause you there, yeah. um, in his bold anti-cancer stance, if one of the arguments that pharmaceutical lobbyists have been making to try to keep the Biden administration, and successfully so far, from lifting patent protections is that then China or Russia might use this mRNA technology and cure cancer. We can't have that. It's like, yeah. Oh, wait, oh. We don't want them to cure cancer. Oh, Wait a yeah, second. Get, Hold the yeah, phone. You're right. <laughs> what are yeah, we well, talking a, about here? That's a perfect, actually, perfect example of how xenophobia and uh, you know jingoism are actually more important than providing you know Americans the world. And of course, if they discover a cure to cancer, we're all going to have access to that too. But that's a great metaphor for how much more. Um, important these kind of nationalist America first projects are than the healthcare of people, including the people in the United States. Even if that is his general position on intellectual property, this certainly is an issue of exceptional magnitude and should be evaluated in isolation from one's position on copyright more broadly. To have said this in what may be the most major speech of his presidency so far as this begins to become a mainstream issue is not reassuring. As usual though, Bernie Sanders is also involved in this story. In April, after the WTO Director General urged the WTO member nations to address inequitable access to vaccines, some member countries are saying mainly from developing countries that the idea of the intellectual property constraint should be waived completely so that any con con uh, members can manufacture. Others are saying, wait a minute, we invested a lot of money or companies did. If you do that, there'll be no encouragement. And what I'm saying is, you know, let's not spend, as we spend time in these arguments, people are dying, we are not getting the vaccines. There is a way uh, which is a compromise in the middle, which private sector companies are already doing. They are licensing uh, companies in developing countries uh, to produce and manufacture these vaccines and, and these drugs, uh, Sherwin. And uh, one of the biggest problems we have is just a sheer manufacturing constraint in the world. Bernie Sanders and nine other Democratic senators urged President Joe Biden to back a temporary patent waiver for COVID-19 vaccines, allowing countries to manufacture treatments locally and accelerate the global vaccination effort. President Biden may well have the power to save the world from a looming crisis, but will he be able to overcome his ideological position on intellectual property? 
and take advantage of that. I want to say a very special thank you to everyone who has made it to the end of this video and as YouTube obligates me to, I have to remind you to that if you like this video, smash the like button and subscribe and do all that social stuff because it really helps the channel grow. If you want to support the channel in other ways, like Real Progressives or these other Foxy patrons do, you can always donate at Patreon or make a one-time donation at Coffee, and help me afford to take the time out to do the work and do the research and keep making content like this while also being able to keep it commercial free. Thanks so much to everyone who supports this channel, I wouldn't want to do it without you all.